Good morning, family. Thanks for joining me. I hope you're doing well in these trying times. We're looking at Elisha the prophet in the book of 2 Kings. It's a political book, and we're preparing for the elections in November. And we're learning how to think politically as people who claim to love and follow Jesus. Let me remind you again that 2 Kings was written for people who were living in exile. And the theme of the book is remember who you are. In 2 Kings, we find examples of the truth that God's ways are higher than man's ways. Man's ways are not God's ways. God's ways are better than man's ways. The first readers of 2 Kings were Israelites living in a foreign country, tempted by foreign customs and foreign gods. Remember who you are, God says. Don't allow the culture to change you. Maintain your identity as a person of God. Or as we read last week, don't sell your sons for the sake of survival. You can trust God to take care of you. Last week we discussed the three confessions we need to make in regard to politics. One, Jesus is Lord. Two, our main citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And three, our chief identification is with the church of Jesus Christ. Did you make these confessions this week? Did those claims help you or make a difference in your life this week? Today I'd like us to consider two more stories from the book of 2 Kings. The first story is found in chapter 3. The second story is found in chapter 4. Let's start with the second story, because that makes sense, right? It's the better of the two, and it picks up right where we left off last week. One day, Elisha the prophet visited a home in a place called Shunem. A couple invited him in, and the wife told him that he could stay with them any time he was in the area, and they would care for him. In fact, they even built a room for him. One day, Elisha asked the woman, After all you've done, what can I do to repay your kindness? I have all I need, she said. I have a home among my people. That's when Elisha told the woman that she would receive something that she didn't already have. Within a year's time, he said, she would bear a son. And she replied, Don't get my hopes up. And sure enough, she conceived and gave birth to a son. One day, the boy complained about his head. Maybe he had a headache? And then he died in his mother's arms. The woman placed him on the bed they'd reserved for Elisha, and then she went out to find the prophet. When she found Elisha, she told him the dreadful news that her son had died. Elisha gave his staff to his servant and instructed his servant to go to the house and lay the staff on top of the boy. When the servant did this, nothing happened. Now, let's pick up the story in verse 32. Hear the word of the Lord. Elisha came into the house and saw the boy lying dead on his bed. He went in and closed the door behind the two of them. Then he prayed to the Lord. He got up on the bed and lay down on top of the child, putting his mouth on the boy's mouth, his eyes on the boy's eyes, his hands on the boy's hands. And as he bent over him, the child's skin grew warm. Then Elisha got down and paced back and forth in the house. Once again he got up on the bed and bent over the boy, at which point the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha called for his servant Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite woman. Gehazi called her, and she came to Elisha. He told her, Pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, face down on the ground. Then she picked up her son and left. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the first story that I briefly mentioned a moment ago is found in 2 Kings chapter 3. The country of Moab was a neighbor of Israel, and the king of Moab owed a large debt to the king of Israel.
but the king of Israel died. So the king of Moab decided not to pay. But the new king of Israel thought he deserved the payment. So he called a couple of other kings and said, Help me get what is owed to me. Join with me and go to war against Moab. The other kings agreed, and they all rode off across the desert. And it wasn't too long before they got into deep trouble. They ran out of water, and soldiers started dying of thirst. Then someone suggested that they ask the prophet Elisha what to do. They sent for the prophet, and Elisha said, God never told you to do this. You acted on your own. Why are you consulting God now? And this is where it gets interesting. God did help them. He provided streams of water in the desert so that they could drink. Now, the Moabite army was watching. From a distance, those streams of water looked to them like streams of blood. The Moabites thought that the soldiers were killing each other. So the Moabites rode in to finish off and plunder the Israelites. But when they got there, they were surprised to see that there were no rivers of blood and that the soldiers were alive and well, and the Israelites defeated the Moabites. It was such a humiliating defeat that the king of Moab killed his own son as a sacrifice to his pagan gods. In the end, the king of Israel went home empty-handed. He never got the payment that he wanted. So what do these two stories have in common? On the one hand, we have a king who thought he deserved more than he got. On the other hand, we have a childless woman, generous and gracious, with no thought for what she could get. She was content to have a home among her people. We have a king who saw what he wanted and went after it, and we have a woman who thought she would never have the one thing she truly desired. One acted irresponsibly, the other acted responsibly. One had no faith in God, the other had great faith in God. The king took charge of things. The woman trusted her affairs to God. Now hold on to that for a moment. She trusted the affairs of her life to God, and God gave her a baby boy. As the years passed, the boy grew. One day he went out to the field with his father, and his head started to bother him. His father sent the boy home to his mother. She wrapped him up in her arms, and there he died. Then the woman laid him on the bed reserved for the prophet Elisha. When she found Elisha to ask him for help, Elisha's servant asked, What's wrong? And the woman said, Everything's okay. Isn't that a curious answer? Her only son had just died. Things were definitely not okay. And things were not okay for the king. He wanted more. In his craving for more, he risked everything on a selfish, ill-conceived effort to get more by aligning himself with foreign powers. And he never consulted God. God was an afterthought. And even though God bailed him out, the Bible tells us that God's wrath was on him. On the other hand, the woman, when her son died, immediately turned to God. She rushed to find Elisha, all the while believing that no matter how bleak things looked, everything was okay because she trusted God. Now, I think this is more than just positive mental attitude. She had faith in God. Don't lose sight of the fact that this woman received a son, apparently against all odds, from the hand of God. Do you know what having a son meant? In biblical times, a son was a sign of God's blessing. You were blessed if you had a son or sons. The more sons you had, the more blessed you were. Daughters? Not so much. Sorry, ladies. God showed favor by giving this woman a son. But to the king of Israel, even though God rescued him from certain disaster, God did not show favor. 
Instead, God's wrath was on him. Here we have a king who trusted himself more than he trusted God. And in the end, the result was miserable failure. But a childless woman displayed great trust in God. Her faith was so great that at the moment of her greatest loss, she declared, everything is okay. And in the end, it was okay. Elisha, in a curious display, helped to raise her boy from the dead. So here's the million-dollar question. Do we have enough faith in God that we can look at our circumstances, survey the political landscape, and declare with confidence, everything is okay. The story of the king of Israel is a reminder of the futility of the ways of the world, where a thirst for wealth can lead to danger and thoughts of invincibility and causes us to act irresponsibly or irrationally. But what of the woman who lost her son? Who in their right mind looks at the body of their dead son and declares, everything is okay? Only people who are either crazy or who live their lives where miracles are commonplace. Only people who are tuned into the life of God's eternal kingdom where death is never the last word. To see the way of God's salvation, to see the good news, we need to have a vision for how God operates. Remember, we've been saying this every week. God's ways are not man's ways. Man's ways are not God's ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are far above our ways. And God does not operate according to the ways of earthly kings and presidents. So shouldn't we trust in God's ways? The comparison between these two stories provides us with a challenge. Will we trust ourselves, our ambitions, and our desires? Or will we trust God's way of doing things? Which, by the way, is not an invitation to be hands-off or irresponsible. The world operates according to the ways of kings and presidents. And that may look appealing. But we need to have faith if we are going to see God's salvation. As we read through the Bible, and as we look back over church history, we find that time after time, the people of God have a habit of ignoring God's ways so that they can live and operate the way their neighbors live and operate. And time after time, God says, this is not the way I want you to live. Power, influence, and wealth are extremely tempting. Now let me ask you this. What did God do when he sent Jesus to live as one of us? He gave us an example of what it looks like to live according to God's ways and not the ways of kings and presidents. Jesus opposes the way of kings by offering us the way of God. And we have to make a choice. How will we live? God's way or man's way? If you choose the way of Jesus, prepare to be a different kind of person who offers the world the hope of redemption. To live the way of Jesus means to be holy people with different values. It means that we are people who have a vision large enough to resist the temptation to align ourselves with earthly kings and presidents. Our hope is not in kings. Our faith is not in presidents. And regardless of what happens on election day, because our faith is in God, because we choose to live by God's ways and not the way of kings, we can declare with confidence, everything is going to be okay. Amen? Let's pray. Good and gentle God, help us not to live in fear, but to trust you more. Be truth to us. Speak truth to us. Forgive us for worrying more than we should. Help us to be positive. Help us to look up. Help us to trust in your unfailing love. God our Father, provider of green pastures and quiet waters, be the peace in our hearts today. Jesus, our guide on mountaintop and in valley deep, 
Be the hope in our hearts today. Spirit of truth and knowledge, our comforter and friend, be the strength in our hearts today and every day. And now, using the words debts and debtors, let us pray with boldness the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks again for joining me today. This week, remember who you are, and love at least three people and make sure at least one of them doesn't deserve it, okay? Because everyone needs to know that God loves them no matter what, right? Don't let these crazy, challenging, chaotic days rob you of your joy. With Jesus, we always, always, always have hope. Now receive these words of benediction. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.